Hello everyone and welcome back to the ultimate fashion history for an episode in our little series Fave Film Fashion. Now this one was recommended to me by so many of you out there. You wrote in and said, Amanda, you have got to start watching this show on HBO because you will love the period costumes. I started watching it and you were right. I love the costumes and the show. So let's take a couple of minutes to celebrate the really brilliant wardrobe in Gentleman Jack. Now, in case you haven't seen it or aren't that familiar with the story, Gentleman Jack is based on the diaries of a real life lady called Anne Lister, who was an English woman living in the 19th century. She was an industrialist, something of an architect and landscape designer, a landowner and a diarist. A lot of her diaries were written in code because she was also a lesbian. The costume designer for Gentleman Jack is the incredibly talented Tom Pye. Now listen, I do have an Ultimate Fashion History episode devoted to the 1830s and 1840s. It's one of my earlier videos, so it's very dry and academic, but I really get into the nitty gritty of wardrobe in the 1830s in that one. Before I go on, I should say that I'm only halfway through Gentleman Jack, so no spoilers are coming my way, and please don't give me any. I am so glad that you guys took me into watching Gentleman Jack. The reason that I sort of steered a little clear to begin with is because I often have a problem with contemporary films or TV shows set in the 1830s because... Usually, costume designers tasked with creating female wardrobe for a show set in the 1830s modify it so much that it's unrecognizable. Why do they modify it? Because, as you all know, the 1830s female fashion silhouette was bizarre. And so they modify it so that it reads as sexy and attractive to the modern eye. Tom Pye did not do this. He kept all of it in its bizarre glory. Look at those shoulders. They almost rival Thierry Mugler in the 80s, don't they? Now, I think that when it comes to female fashion in the 1830s, people fall into two camps. Either you love it or you think it's extremely unflattering and bizarre. I used to fall into the second camp until I started to learn more about why people dress this way and wanted to present this way. Fashion is not an island, it's a response, remember. The reason that Mr. Pye and director Sally Wainwright decided to keep the female costumes in Gentleman Jack true to historical form is because they wanted Anne Lister's character and her mode of dress to really stand out against the other characters to show that she was different. She was a maverick. She did not fit in with the mores or the aesthetic of the women around her of her era. Anne Lister is played, by the way, by Saran Jones, who is brilliant. In fact, the whole cast are brilliant, including the actress here on the left. Do you recognize her? When I started watching Gentleman Jack, it drove me crazy for about 10 minutes. I kept thinking, who is this actress? I've seen her in something recently. Well, of course, all of you instantly recognize her as Gemma Whalen from Game of Thrones, who plays a very different character in Game of Thrones than she does in Gentleman Jack. So let's take a moment to consider this really odd 1830s silhouette and why it happened. There were basically no shoulders at all to a garment for a female, and then suddenly these huge gigot sleeves with sleeve plumpers. The waistline wasn't on pier, but it wasn't at the waist either. It fell somewhere sort of in between. So the silhouette was very dainty. It was very childlike and doll-like. Now this was the era of acquisition, wasn't it? This was the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution impacted fashion more than any other thing impacted fashion in the 19th century. Although you can't see the feet here, hemlines became a little shorter, adding to this doll-like overall aesthetic, the era of acquisition, and certainly the era when a woman's place was as a wife or a mother or a daughter. 
She was sort of the property of her father or husband or brother, and then when she got older, of her son. Anne Lister had a very different idea to a woman's place in 19th century society. But I think that there was a lot going on with this silhouette. And then if you add the pelerine, these lace capelets with pointy ends that were fastened over a garment, you see that the upper part of the body becomes very, very wide. This was an era when people got rich quick. This was the era of the burgeoning nouveau riche. People were living large. And so the silhouette got large. Add to that a lot of bows and lace and a deep brimmed bonnet. And we have this uber feminized, rather strange, very wide, but dainty silhouette. I think you can see why most costume designers modify it today when recreating it on screen. But Tom Pye didn't, and it makes such a wonderful contrast with his wardrobe for Anne Lister, which he based very much on her own diaries and a discussion of clothing. But we'll talk more about that in a bit. And then just to remind you, it was bold of Mr. Pye to keep this massive silhouette on screen. It works so perfectly, though. And of course, throughout the 19th century, adornment equaled wealth. And in the 1830s, with the burgeoning nouveau riche, the more adornment you had, the more successful and wealthy you were. And look, you were showing your newfound wealth off with bows and ribbons and lace and feathers and artificial ringlets. But not always. And this is where Mr. Pye really is a genius because he also costumed to character and to scene. This is Anne Lister's sister, Marianne, from a wealthy family. But here she is at home wearing a wool dress and she has taken her sleeve plumpers out. Because for more casual, intimate at home moments, even wealthy young women and ladies took their sleeve plumpers out. Sleeve plumpers, just in case you didn't know, were often attached to the underpinnings or a corset. And then you would actually stuff them with these little bags that were full of soft downy feathers. And so you could either just have your sleeves a little bit flat and more comfortable or puff them up to really show off how wealthy and fashionable you were. Here's another image of this odd silhouette. This is a museum piece. Do you like this? I don't like this, but I think that's okay. I always say to my fashion history students, you don't have to like everything. Just understand it. Appreciate why it happened, but you don't have to love everything. And I gotta be honest, I don't love this. I never thought the 1830s aesthetic and the pelerine and the sleeve plumpers would ever come back, but oh look, They've had their moments, at least on the runway. Let's look at Tom Pye's vision for his costumes for Anne Lister, Saran Jones. He based her wardrobe on the real Anne Lister, on the few portraits that exist of her and from her diaries. Naturally, a lot of this is based on menswear of the 1830s. She dresses almost exclusively in black or dark tones, as did all men of this era. He said in an interview that he originally tried putting her in pantaloons, but that it didn't seem right. It seemed too far-fetched. This takes place in Halifax in the 1830s. No woman would have worn any kind of trouser or pantaloon or breeches, so... He put her in skirts as the real Anne Lister wore. There is so much attention to detail in the wardrobe for Saran Jones. I really think that Tom Pye was definitely looking to Beau Brummel a little bit earlier for inspiration, fob watches and velvet trim and neckerchiefs. A lot of the garments were actually drawn from Anne Lister's diary, for example. She spoke about wearing her Spencer, and so he designed her a Spencer. 
Mr. Pye did admit in an interview, though, that he cheated with Anne's signature top hat because the real Anne Lister did not wear a top hat. Evidently, she wore a flat black velvet cap, maybe something a little bit like this, but come on, the top hat is so iconic and eye-catching. And Mr. Lister said he didn't feel he was being entirely anachronistic because he looked to images and etchings of the ladies of Langolin, a famous same-sex couple of the same era who were famous for wearing top hats. Speaking of top hats, did I ever share with you my theory about top hats, toppers in the 19th century? Well, of course, Gentleman Jack is set in the 1830s before top hats got this tall and certainly before they got this tall. Why did men, these industrialists, wear these tall top hats? I have a theory. Tell me what you think. Again, it goes back to the Industrial Revolution. The chimneys smoking from factories, funnels on steamships, on steam trains. I really think that the top hat subconsciously evoked chimneys, funnels, steam, the Industrial Revolution. What do you think? Let's talk about the hair and makeup in Gentleman Jack. The makeup designer was Lynn Davy, and the hair designer was Sue Newbold and they did a fantastic job, including the addition of artificial ringlets and curls. Artificial hair was a big thing in the 19th century. I always think it's sort of funny when you look on YouTube and you find young girls giving tutorials on how to get 19th century hair and they go through such pains to get ringlets and all of this and these complicated updos when in fact so many women wore fake hair in the 19th century Dickens writes of it, sort of the precursor to my dollops in a way. Evidently the only time in the whole series that Sir Anne Jones wears white and conforms to feminine fashion aesthetics of the 1830s is in the final episode. So I don't know why she does. I haven't watched it yet. No spoilers, please. Anyway, I am thoroughly enjoying Gentleman Jack. It's so interesting from a social and cultural point of view. The sets are gorgeous. The acting is superb. It's also very funny. And thank you, Tom Pye, for getting the 1830s right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Faith Film Fashion here on The Ultimate Fashion History. You can contact me and learn more about me through my website, amandahalle.com, or simply drop me a line through Facebook. And while you're over there, join our Facebook group. Check out our books on Dean Street Press. I'll be back very soon with more episodes on The Ultimate Fashion History. So just click that little circle to subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye for now.